Hello everyone. Uh, today we've got a guest and I'm going to be talking a little later to Chris, Christo Tron. Christo is a VAT expert and he is the founder of Trade Tax Plus. I've known Christo for many, many years and he truly is one of South Africa's um, top VAT experts. We're going to talk to Christo about the VAT implications on rebate item 41211. We've been receiving all kinds of queries. Some of them have been quite alarming. And instead of me walking you through what I think the interpretation of the VAT issues are, we're going to be talking to Christo. So we're going to be trying our hand at uh, more of these interviews and just yeah, keep an eye peeled. It's proven to be quite a technology challenge to get this thing right. But I think over time we'll, we'll improve. We've got a few updates for you before we switch to the interview. Uh, on rebate item 41211, you're automatically excluded from this rebate if any of the items currently attract either an anti-dumping or safeguard duty, or if the duties are currently under investigation by ITAC. ITAC have also published a simplified certificate if you are imp importing goods under rebate which don't attract duty but which uh, you still need a VAT exemption on. So rather than having to specifically apply for a certificate from ITAC, you now have a blanket certificate. You can visit our COVID-19 resource page to get it. Uh, if you're struggling with this, you can send us an email at covid19 at xa.co.za. And then also an update to rebate item 62108. This is the expedited registration process for the rebate of duty on alcohol. This is important. If you are currently not registered as an excise user, there's a two step process you have to go through. So given that most disinfectant manufacturers would not usually use potable alcohol in their mix. Uh, this means that many of these companies are not in fact registered for excise. So for companies like this to benefit, you first have to register with SARS as an excise client and then you can apply for the, the rebate. I mean, of course, you can do both simultaneously. And SARS are turning these around fairly quickly at the moment. So again, if you have any questions about this, drop us an email and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, COVID-19 at xa.co.za and now we're going to switch over to Krista. How's it Krista? How's life in lockdown with your family at the moment? Well my family is only four and um, three of them are well grown up or all grown up but then there's me but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's sometimes in this house that we live we hardly see each other in any way so uh, they might be somewhere out there. It's, it's not, not too much of a challenge. <laughs> With the online business that I'm running, it's uh, not really almost business as usual. Yeah. Yeah, I guess we, we're, we're also in the fortunate position of, uh, of being able to work from anywhere. In fact, it, it, it does make me wonder if we have a need for offices at the end of this. So we'll, we will see. I think, um, that challenge, I think that challenge is going to come from many employers. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think they're going to be landlords in, in real, real trouble and not just the guys that were selling retail space to Edcon, but uh, in office parks, you know, I, I would guess a lot of people are going through the same calculation that we are going through at the moment. Like, do you really require the space? But um, we've adapted well and I'm, I'm, I'm glad this hasn't really impacted you. Thank you. Uh, Christo, we've we've been getting quite a lot of questions following uh, the the publication of the the rules for rebate item four twelve eleven, and quite a number of these queries that have come through have related to VAT. And I thought rather than than me trying to answer these questions, it would make sense to pose them to you as a as a VAT expert. And so maybe. Just the, the start of this is 412.11 allows people to import certain essential goods uh, and not pay VAT or duties at the time of import. And probably the, the most common question I've received is, do I still need to charge VAT if I sell these essential goods afterwards? So maybe you could just walk through the audience um, how this works. Yeah, sure. The, the mechanism contained in, in 412.11 
uh, is simply a mechanism that governs what taxes are payable at the time of importation, nothing else. So when I import goods normally, I would pay my customs duty, I would pay my VAT, the customs duty normally would remain a cost of, of landing goods, and the VAT would be, generally speaking, you'll be able to claim it back, back as input tax. So the purpose of this is purely to say, listen, we know there's going to be huge volumes of that kind of product coming in now to avoid this cash flow negativity for the importer. They scrap the import that, but everything thereafter happens as normally. So even for the importer, it's just a cash flow issue. So they don't pay the VAT on importation, but there's clearly also no input tax deduction for them subsequently. So they get the benefit of not having to pay the VAT immediately, but thereafter, um, whoever the supplies made to the normal VAT rules apply. So if you would supply normally zero rated stuff, let's say a certain, a certain product, fresh fruit, for example, would be zero rated. So that's still zero rated if you sell it, but uh, locally. But uh, masks, for example, that's a standard rated supply. If you, if you sell it locally, that's standard rated. So no, no items have been added to the zero rated list um, as a result of COVID-19 and the lockdown procedures and the urgency to receive these critical products into the country? No, no, no the, the VAT Act hasn't changed anything. It wasn't a single change to the VAT Act. The only thing that happened is that an, an exemption that was there in any event, always, has now been triggered by the announcement of the, of the state of, of um, disaster. And that uh, ex, ex, exemption that's been triggered is an exemption from importation VAT. It's always been there. It's not a new, it's not new legislation. Yes. Okay, so Christo, if, 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 if I have brought something in and I've unsold the goods and I didn't charge VAT on it because I thought at the time that I could zero rate this, um, what do I do in that position? Well, you must firstly, first and foremost, hope that the transaction hasn't been finally concluded. In other words, there hasn't been offer and acceptance. Because the moment that happens, the price is fixed. If that has happened, the VAT Act simply says um, the, 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 the amount charged includes VAT. So whatever you have charged, 15 over 115, which is a tax fraction of that amount, goes to such. Um, which, if you're working on, on, on very thin margins, could, could I guess, guess kill you. But there's no other way out. That is what the law says. And, and of course, you, you, there's no offset of the input VAT either. So effectively, the, the output VAT, the amount that you should have on your invoice, is the full amount paid over to SARS or payable to SARS. Well, um, if that's the only transaction done, your normal input you'll get, your rental, your offices and all that kind of stuff. But if you're only, if you're only buying... Uh, importing the goods and on-selling the goods, then 100% correct. There is no input to claim, and whatever you charge account, there's output on that. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, another question I've I've received, Christo, is uh, firstly, if I'm if I am making the sale to to government, do I still need to charge VAT? And remember, a lot of people that are using this rebate are very often people who've never traded before. Um, or certainly not in products like this, and government is now a customer. So another question I've been receiving is, what happens if I sell to government? What happens if I sell to a public benefit organization? And maybe you can just describe that and maybe even just walk through what a, what a public benefit organization is and what the VAT implications are on a sale like that. Uh, a, a public benefit organization for VAT purposes they make a split between your normal association not for gain, which essentially is I, I, they, I'm there, my actions, my activities are aimed at bettering the community as opposed to um, be a profit to the proprietor. And then the other element or the other side of that is a wealthy organization. But none of those organizations or government organizations or government departments, they all fall in the same a category as simply being a recipient of a supply. That's all they are. So there's no distinction in the VAT Act that the person that receives this gets the benefit of the tax. It's the person that makes the supply that must determine 
whether that is payable or not. So when you uh, sell to these organizations, um, then it would, those organizations, VAT would be normally payable if I am an organization that making, that's making taxable supplies, and I'm assuming this is being sold by a person that is registered as a VAT vendor. That is just normal 15% VAT on that. The only way to get past this is if if I enter into an agreement with you beforehand that 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 you will be the importer of those goods. So let's say the government department would import that, I will facilitate the process and, and get an import commission. Then the government department or the or the whoever whoever the recipient is, whether it's a PBO or whoever else then they become the legal importer of those goods, even though I'm facilitating that. Then the zero, then the exemption would apply to them because they become the importer, in which case they will get that direct benefit of, of, of the land cost excluding VAT. But the moment you interpose somebody in the middle that is not an agent, in other words, a principal to principal transaction, the benefit ends with at, the, at that first level of, of importation. You can put it in another way. If you and I import that uh, as the final consumer, then we're getting the benefit because we will get we will we will acquire those goods for own use, but without uh, paying VAT on it. But the moment we on sell that, as no longer being the final consumer, that clicks in again. You see, in fact, it it, it raises just another important issue, which it, it is clear, but maybe needs to be reiterated that this is. This permit that is issued by ITAC that allows you to, to benefit from the rebate is not transferable. So the, the company who is named on the face of the permit also has to be the importer of record. Um, we can't have a, a situation where it's a different business. Um, that would be problematic. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, this is on that, on that topic. Um, ITAC would only issue a certificate for goods that where there is duty payable. Um, so if, if, if you have essential goods where there is no duty payable, what ITAC has done is they've issued a blanket, um, a, a, a blanket, um, what do you call it? A um, certificate yes. uh, permit. So they've issued a blanket permit, which is on the ITAC um, website. You can go there, download it. And it tells you exactly what is included and what's not. But essentially, what, what's included is all the necessities um, listed there, which is the food and all sorts of things. It still excludes liquor. It still excludes your cigarettes. So those are, those are not going to happen. But um, for those those items, you can import that without a certificate. So that, but the, it's only in respect of of uh, goods where there is duty payable that that the ITAC. Um, ITAC certificate becomes or permit becomes important. And the reason why this is, is that it, they have to manage our global positioning. It's a huge risk that people now abuse this as a window period to import massive amounts of stock and then just stockpile it. Um, and that's what ITAC would not allow. They want to see that the goods come in, go, it goes either go straight to the beneficiary or it goes into a process that will, will in a short period of time result in a product which is uh, an essential need. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, we've, uh, you know, one of the things we're quite worried about at the moment and we'll be exploring a little bit further is there's, a, there's also a, a rebate, uh, a rebate that's always existed, but it's kind of been expedited by SARS, which um, allows the rebate of the excise duties on alcohol to happen mm -hmm. if, if you're using the alcohol to produce disinfectant. Um, mm -hmm. There's, there's, you know, interesting questions around what happens with that alcohol if it's if it's been sold to someone to produce disinfectant, and the state of disaster ends, but they still have the alcohol in their in their tanks unused. Uh, that isn't absolutely clear around what occurs at that point because the rebate is only available to someone for as long as the state of disaster is in place. So. Uh, there are some interesting questions to to just think about. You know, how does that how does that get handled? Um, I, yeah, I, and I think I, you saw that to move really quickly on this, and so have ITAC. Yeah. And so also these these rules are being amended on on the fly. Uh, someone said to me, 
we're uh, we're building the aircraft while we're flying it, which I think is probably quite a quite an accurate description. So, um, Christo, mm -hmm. if if people have additional VAT questions, can we just send them to uh, tradetaxplus.com? That's welcome, or they can send it to you, and you can just forward it to me. Um, yeah. It is it is these are difficult and 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 extraordinary times we're living in. So um, let's get just let's get through it. Just to get to your, your comment you've made just now about the excess alcohol, uh, ITAC is going to take a very specific, uh, stringent view at what that people do not abuse this to stockpile. Um, it shouldn't be done and it, and, it, and it won't be done. So that's on the one side. The other thing is, which I think is just worthwhile mentioning, the COVID-19 um, period is not the 21 days. This it could still go on for months, and and maybe for very long. So the legislation talks about the clamp down, not the clamp lockdown period, which is in 21 days, which could be extended. But the the COVID-19 period is probably still going to be with us uh, for for many months afterwards, in yeah. some form or another. Well, Christo, thank you very much. Um, if anyone has any questions, they're welcome to email us at COVID-19 at xa.co.za. And remember to subscribe to the YouTube channel, ring the bell, and you'll be alerted every time there's a new video. Christo, thank you very much. Uh, be safe and we'll speak soon. You're most welcome and be safe too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.